introduction for setting up the talk, and uh, you know, I should also probably start by uh, by thanking everyone here at the archives uh, because the book certainly would not exist without it. Um, there's chunks of material from all, all over the country, um, but you know, the bulk of the material, of course, for a book about Butte is from Butte, and so. Um, I think I conducted most of the research for this book between somewhere, oh, I think 2008 to 2012 or something like that. Um, and so um, Ellen and Harriet and, uh, is this okay? Wait, am I Hello? Any better? Is that different? No? So at the time I was doing research for this book is when they were uh, busy renovating this wonderful archive. Um, and so I thought this was going to be a big disaster, um, but um, Ellen and Harriet and Aubrey uh, moved all of my uh, materials uh, into a special room there at, uh, at Old Central. And uh, so I had like my own little research haven that I could uh, return to where all of my materials were for a number of years. Um, I think this book, this book probably came from um, visits to Butte when I was a kid. I came here to play soccer and had a lot of questions about Butte and no one who wasn't for Butte could answer any of them, right? So I think that's probably some of the origins. And then I, I also remember I was, uh, as an undergrad when I was doing college at, in Missoula, um, I, I also remember having a, a Montana history class with um, Harry Fritz. And he made the comment uh, at one of the lectures that no one would ever take you seriously as a Montana historian if you didn't study Butte. And I apparently always had that in the back of my head. So when I was a graduate student um, in, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, um, I actually ended up uh, kind of gradually and eventually centering um, some research on Butte, which uh, eventually became this book. So uh, I, I did a lot of research here. I did a lot of research at the Montana Historical Society. Um, there are in this book, include, I think I looked at at least, oh, I just counted them up recently, 160 oral history interviews, most of which are here in the archive, so you too can go look at them or read them or listen to them. I conducted, I think, 25 or so myself. Those are also here at the archives that you can see. Um, and then I went and found a lot of other records. Um, there's company records, so there's corporate records for the Anaconda Company in Laramie, Wyoming, of all places, at the American Heritage Center. So if you're interested, especially in geology, there's essentially the entire geological department's record set is sitting there. Um, a Helena, of course. Um, Pennsylvania for union records. That's where a lot of the United Steel worker, workers' records ended up. So. Um, it was a fun project because it also, although it's about one place, it kind of took me all over the place, right? Um, and so, really, I had this one big central question. My first initial question is a pretty easy one to figure out, which is that I came here, I saw this big hole in the ground, and I asked, why is that there? And I was told it was to mine things, and that was <laughs> where this started. Um, and then as I asked more questions, I, I had been essentially told that there were people who had lived in some area nearby where the pit was who were no longer there. And so really the, the, the book kind of started with me trying to figure out what happened to the people who lived there, right? Where did they go? Why did they go there? How did the company make a big shift from underground mining to open pit mining? What did that mean for the town? Um, what did that mean for the people who were working in mining? Uh, what did that mean for community members who lived near the Berkeley pit? And so. The end result is a kind of a series of, of discussions um, about uh, the Berkeley Pit, both kind of how it started, how it developed, um, and uh, what effects it had on the people around here. This is actually kind of the outline of the book if uh, you haven't seen it. So I, I start out and I tell you a little bit about uh, what happened in Butte before the period I'm most interested in, right, which is the open pit era. And the nice part about Butte is that there's tons of great history written about it, and everybody in Butte is a historian themselves, typically. Um, and so I was able to draw on a lot of uh, great previous work uh, to do that. And the rest of the work, right, I think in general with kind of modern history, because it's so recent and a lot of us were live during it, right, we don't think of it often as history. And so that was a lot of the work there was trying to figure out 
this period, right, from the 50s onward in terms of what happened and what it actually meant. Um, and especially now, right, that you have the ability to access old union records, the ability to access old company records, I think you're able to tell a full story that maybe would have been harder even, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So, uh, you know, I'm obviously not going to cover all of this, right? A lot of, there's a, a chunk of this book, right, that is about kind of work at the Berkeley Pit, what it was like to work there, especially um, for people who moved from the underground uh, mining industry to above ground mining, right? What did that mean and how did they feel about that? Um, there's a, another part of this book, right, which is about people's experience, kind of a new experience of types of hazards um, that came from open pit mining, right? What was it like to then live with, you know, blasting all the time, right? How did the company negotiate, right? Figure out how to make things more amenable to the people who are living nearby. And then how did the company and people in Butte manage the process of acquisition of these different areas that eventually were removed, right? Both to make room for the pit, but really and often uh, times to make room for a buffer zone for the pit, right? Because the AM County Company, of course, didn't want to face a lot of complaints, right? They wanted a buffer. Right, so a lot of people were moved, were, to some degree, kind of to try and create a buffer there between, you know, the places where we live and the places where we work. Um, and then the end of this book uh, spends some time looking at kind of the end of the Berkeley Pit itself and its continuing resonance. Right, I think it's it's an important symbol, really, not just for Butte, right, but for a lot of the rest of the region. How to become a a symbol of well, in some cases, right, became a symbol for a lot of the state of the environmental destruction that would be done if something X or Y other project would happen, right? For other parts, right, it was a symbol of, you know, old industry gone by, right? That this was a symbol of the, the American West transitioning from, you know, an old industrial West to one that was going to be based on uh, tourism and uh, fun living, right? And so I, I talk a lot about that in the rest of this book. All right, so what I'm actually going to talk about today, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, workers and their transition from underground to open pit mining. Um, and then I tell you a little bit about um, one of the neighborhoods. I thought I'd focus in on Meterville um, and its experience and some of the people um, negotiating what happened um, when uh, Meterville uh, was acquired, right, bit by bit and piece by piece by the Anaconda Company and people were moved away. All right, so let's talk underground dangers first. Um, uh, one of the, my favorite oral histories um, was uh, from a former kind of uh, company employee, Albinus. Uh, I was talking about his working life, and I, I think one of my favorite, the reason why it's one of my favorite here is that, you know, he's asked this question, the question being, right, what was it like to move from being part of the labor force right to management? And he essentially explained that instead the hardest thing in his entire 40-year career in the mining industry was not becoming a boss, it was going from underground to open pit. And I remember reading this and thinking, huh, maybe I should actually figure out what was going on with workers in their lives. Um, I think his reaction, though, was not unusual. And certainly when I talked to a lot of people who made that same transition, you had to kind of forget everything about mining because the open pit was such a different kind of change. And the switch in Butte, right, uh, became permanent when underground mining shut down in 1974, right? And then it was only open pit mining that was left. Um, those Anaconda company, uh, employees, right, who kept their jobs found, you know, this above ground work description to be pretty uh, radically altered, right? Um, their labor was then placed under what they thought was increased scrutiny, right? So this kind of bringing work above ground made it more efficient, right, because you get bigger machines, you get more rapid production, right? And it was also a lot safer, right? But I'd say, actually, oddly enough, despite the fact that it was so much safer, right, than the underground mines, Butte miners often would talk about this transition as, as being a, a rather depressing one, right? For them, it was a transition from this kind of enlivened, exciting underground work in which you got a, a fair amount of credit, right, in the community for being an underground miner and facing those dangers every day, to suddenly, right, it felt more like kind of construction work, right? You were moving big machines, you were blowing stuff up, um, and it didn't really feel that different in terms of their life. <clears throat> Um, Anaconda itself, right, didn't feel a lot of need to apologize, right, for open pit mining's effects. Um, and I'd say that's largely because, right, in the early 20th century, underground mining was the most dangerous profession in the U.S. and, in fact, really the, the world. I mean, the, I think the only rival to Butte's dangerous underground were, uh, was in South Africa and their diamond mines, right? So this is serious business. A lot of people died. 
Um, and so this is a pretty risky workplace. Um, there were frequent accidents, right? There were possibly underground fires, machinery malfunctions, which meant a lot more, right, when you're underground. Um, and certainly, Butte's workers, right, when they went underground, found this totally different, right? There was all this kind of natural process that they got to see, right, running mine water, um, human uh, uh, changes. Um, no matter what the temperature was on the surface, right, some levels in the mines, right, are naturally hot, some levels in the mines are naturally cold, right? Um, and so you could sometimes be quite humid, right, because there's running water often through these tunnels, um, and they, cop it, they call it like copper water, right, it would eat through your boots, that's why you have to have, you know, steel-toed boots. Um, right, and there's decaying timber, right, because of the water, right, so this actually in some ways, right, the actual kind of new natural environment they had to live with underground made it even more dangerous. Not to mention, right, what they called miners' consumption, right, but silicosis, right, where you'd be drilling and blasting things, there'd be a lot of particulate matter in the air, you'd breathe it in, it's dangerous, right, it's uh, what uh, certainly caused the deaths of many people. Um, I'd say, in general, right, they would say, right, I'm lucky I survived, and so bringing work to the surface, right, was, was great, right, um, in some ways, right? It was easier to see oncoming problems, right, when you're above ground. Um, when you're on the surface, right, there's just larger spaces. You can maneuver dangerous equipment. You can pay more attention when there's blasts, right? You're less likely to catch people um, unawares, right? And so there are certainly many miners, right, who actually wanted to move to the surface for this reason, right? Or who told their kids, right, Sure, I'm doing this great dangerous job, but please never do this, right? This is dangerous work. I don't want to have to worry about you. Go work in open pit mining, right? Um, I'd say in the Berkeley pit, right, it was still dangerous though, right? And here's some kind of fun images. This a gentleman over here in all the Anaconda Company literature is named Hey Parr, by the way. In case you're on the <laughs> and he would tell you, right, um, how he would tell you all about the different dangers you're going to face, right? Um, the, the Berkeley pit, right, had some dangers, right? There's, it's repetitive, right, especially if you're driving haul trucks, right, just kind of driving back and forth, and so there's always dangers of people falling asleep. Um, there's other dangers, right, just the fact that it's outdoors, right? I mean, temperatures below ground couldn't, certainly would vary, but, you know, when it's a Rocky Mountain winter, it's a Rocky Mountain winter, right? It's cold, um, and there's snow, and you're trying to deal with it, right? Um, and so, you know, a lot of the people that I interviewed um, would talk a lot about what it was like to try to deal with freezing temperatures, um, dealing with fog, right? Um, dealing with, um, oh, you know, loose ground when it got too wet and you're trying to drive big machines, right? That's hard to do. Um, pit workers also bickered about the quality of the air, right? Um, truck driver Bill Long uh, said a common Berkeley pit joke was, if you can't see it, smell it, or taste it, it ain't real air. <laughs> um, so this is not as dangerous, right, as that kind of silica dust underground, right? But it's also not wonderful, right? You're breathing a lot of fumes, you're breathing in certainly the dust from explosions too, and everything else. Um, they worked a lot to improve safety procedures, right? There was a lot of kind of monitoring of uh, systems, right? Areas liable to slide, right, to kind of slough off. Um, union management, uh, all the leaders, right, were pretty safety conscious, and I think it became safer and safer even over time. Um, so by the 1970s, right, most injuries in the pit were due to, like, people falling off ladders, right, um, or similar minor in incidents, right? Um, and I have a figure here, right, um, it's es estimated there's about, oh, 2,400 mining-related fatalities that occurred in the Butte area from 1889 to 1974, and of that number, there was five. So open bit my safer, clearly, right? And so you can see some of the uh, operations here. This is from a 1959 publication. We've gotten a lot bigger trucks now, don't we? Um, right, so these are, uh, they were pretty big for the time. And certainly the Berkeley pit kind of pioneered um, using trucks um, and a big open pit mine, right? Before this, if you go to a lot of the earlier operations, it's trains usually, right? They would train things out, but then you have to keep moving the train tracks because, right, as you work the open pit, you have to keep expanding the pit, right? So the Brooklyn pit's actually a, really a pioneer in that way. Okay, so what was bad about it, right? Because like I said, there was a lot of, there's a lot of workers who I interviewed, who I found other interviews about, um, who would talk about 
Well, sure, this is a lot safer, but also this is pretty boring, right? Um, and so, you know, I think there was some. There's a lot of complaints about monotony, especially for people, right, who would, who would kind of live with underground mining and, and enjoy, right, the kind of excitement of that. Um, right, underground miners uh, worked often on contract, right. And so when you're working on a contract, right, you're essentially paid for the distance of tunnel uh, you dig or the amount out of ore uh, material that you remove. And so there's also some thrills, right, the danger of underground work, right? Um, it's satisfying, right? If you work harder, you get more money, right? And so contract work in some ways, right, was really treasured by a lot of uh, miners. Um, and so there was, you know, what they saw was kind of freedom, right, uh, camaraderie, prestige, right, kind of a macho work culture, right, that was really disappearing when they moved above ground. Um, for them, right, the causal factor for all of these changes, right, was simply just being above ground, right? Um, and part of this is just that this is kind of routine or semi-routine tasks, right, in a way that a lot of underground mining did not feel like that, right? Um, they also would talk a lot about how they missed the independence, um, the distance, the darkness, right, that underground mining have given them, right? So because contract miners are paid, right, according to the amount of work they accomplished, that means the company didn't really have to supervise them very much, right? So there'd be mine workers, right, who would say that, you know, you're your own boss in the mines, that's because, right, you could literally just go down there sometimes, turn off your headlamp, take a nap, and just get up a little bit later. No one would ever come by to check on you, right? And again, you'd get paid less because you just didn't dig as much, right? So in some ways, right, that was actually a treasured part of the system. The open pit mine, right, removed that independence, right? Um, they, and it kind of tried some things like piecework and contract work. It never quite worked the same way, right? And I think part of this is because, uh, you know, one interview he told me that, you know, open pit mines, the machinery puts out, not the man, right? I think that's true, right? I mean, you've got these big machines doing most of the actual hauling, and you need f fewer workers, right, to operate it, right? But probably in some ways, you actually need more management to oversee the work, right? So there's a pretty dramatic shift in that balance to a lot of workers, right? They felt like um, uh, management was uh, working with them. I, I had one uh, miner, uh, Dan Aguilar, who said something along the lines like he felt like the whole world was watching him in the Berkeley pit, right? Which huh. felt very different to him. Uh, this supervision actually became even uh, uh, stronger, right? But in the mid-1960s, there was also kind of a new control tower, tower for the pit, right? You could actually literally just kind of overlook and oversee everything, right? So again, you're just being supervised more, right? And I think that meant um, uh, a, a fairly different kind of um, work environment, right? Where you would be kind of under management's watch all the time. One of the other themes that came out um, in a lot of the interviews with miners um, was that the work, on, you know, this kind of work environment above ground encouraged more division than cooperation in some ways, right? And I'll, bear with me, and I'll explain to you a little bit about why. Um, right, underground, right, people depended on each other, right? So if you're a motor man, if you're a parts runner moving stuff back and forth, um, if you're a contract miner, even if you're a shift boss, right, you would talk to each other all the time, right? And not just about work, because often, right, you're, you're work, working off of partners, right? So you, you become really deep friends with a lot of these people. Um, in the open pit, right, in a lot of cases, like let's say you're a truck driver or a machine operator, right? Um, uh, I had one interview with a, um, a mine driver, uh, Jane Barcher, who said, right, you didn't have to talk to each other if you didn't want to, right? Because <laughs> essentially, you know, you're just kind of doing this one task. Um, you just kind of drove all day by yourself. Uh, so there was kind of a real change in that way. There's also a change in the power structure in Butte's unions, right? So Butte famously, right, the Gibraltar of unionism, right, this important union town. And really, right, the Butte Miners Union, as the most powerful uh, union in Butte, right, kind of shaped a lot of that union culture, right? There were a few small crafts unions that also worked with the Anaconda Company. But what happened really is there's a big change in what happened, right, for the union's power structure with open pit mining. And that starts even in the 1950s, right? So they actually, the International Union of Operating Engineers, right, are the people who started actually a lot of the open pit mining, not the Butte Miners Union, which of course angered the Butte Miners Union, there's a lot of fights over it, um, right? Eventually, right, there's some juggling that comes together, but what you end up with is by the 60s and 70s, right, you have 13 unions who are all working for the Anaconda Company. They're often uh, bickering amongst each other, right, because there's some real different uh, ways that mining gets organized, right, because in an underground mine, right, 
most, many of them were part of one union, right? And they would work together, they'd cooperate together. They would also be able to do a lot more, well, different tasks, right? So like if something needed to get moved here, you could move here. So they, someone, right, you'd kind of be able to do all the different jobs, right? It was kind of part of the role, right, being the kind of renaissance man of the underground. The open pit, though, right, the union started seeing what everyone else was doing so they could talk to each other about, well, no, like, if a light bulb needs to get moved, that needs to be, right, the electrical engineers, if this person, right, so actually, in some ways, it actually caused more divisions amongst the unions um, that hadn't been there. And there also was more power for a lot of these crafts unions, right, because the Butte Miners Union represented fewer and fewer people, right, so there's more power to different kinds of unions, right. Um, and so there's actually a number of people, mechanics and others, right, who kind of complain that this, this hurt the camaraderie amongst um, people in Butte, especially in this kind of new workplace. Okay, so I mentioned surveillance a little bit. Um, right, there were some interesting ways in which, right, in the pit, right, to reduce bottlenecks, right, you had to kind of press jurisdiction lines, right? And that's partly because of the supervision, right? But there's other ways that people, right, got to be able to figure out this jurisdictional hodgepodge, right? And some of this is just like, right, they're different, wearing different color helmets, right? Anyone who's worked on a kind of work site where you have helmets, right? The helmet will represent often what you do on your job. Same thing here, right, um, in open pit mining, right? So you can actually tell if the person is doing what kind of job in what way, right? Again, very different from the other. I'd say that the, the tensions there between former underground miners um, and workers hired specifically for service operations also lessened labor camaraderie in the Berkeley pit. Um, so long-time miners right, viewed underground mining right, as difficult, it was rewarding, it was prestigious. Um, right? um, they would talk about how they really knew how to work. They were the kings at work, and therefore they were also the kings of town. Right? If you were head of the contract board in the underground, you'd be head, head of town. But there's a lot of miners I interviewed who said stuff like, um, well, here's, here's a good quote. I felt, how can I put it, little in the pit. You had your electricians, you had your boilermakers, you had your pipe fitters, they were the kings down there. Where I fed, went, I was just a laborer, I felt like nothing, right? So again, kind of a real expression of how different, right, this underground workplace had been than this new open pit, right? <clears throat> There's also, right, big changes that happen at the exact same time, right, in the industry, including the introduction of more women into the workplace, right? So if you think of underground mining, right, it was based on what a lot of people kind of talked about, like exaggerated masculinity, right? It was like super macho work, right? You got a lot of pride in doing your macho work. Um, but, right, there's a 1967 amendment to the Civil Rights Act, right, which adds a prohibition against discrimination by federal contractors, subcontractors on the basis of sex, this eventually, right, through a number of lawsuits, transforms the mining industry too, right? And so you get more and more women, right? 1972, the first women began driving haul trucks um, in the Berkeley pit. Um, there were more people who started doing other kinds of roles, right? Now, I would say on one hand, right, there actually were fewer women, few women ever really worked at the Berkeley pit, right? But it certainly changed a lot of what happened and how the workplace felt, right? Um, and part of this is because also, right, as layoffs started happening in the late 70s and early 80s for Anaconda, right, the women had started work later, so they actually were laid off earlier too, right? So in other words, right, I, what I'm trying to get at here is I think this, this is a really different kind of workplace, right, for, um, for uh, above ground miners, especially, right, if you were um, operating now in the open pit. And at the exact same time, right, you have a big shift in just the numbers of workers needed, right? So an open pit mine, right, you just need few workers, right? You need fewer workers to do everything, right? And that's because you've got big machines, you're able to do kind of larger operations. And so the number of changes in Butte are dramatic and certainly affected, right, the overall city's population too, right? Um, here we have a figure in 1950, there was about 6,000 employees for the Anaconda Company in Butte. Um, in 1974, you're at about 2,000, right? Now that drops, again, even more, right? But that's just a shift just between the two <coughs> kinds of mining, right? And I think that really shaped a lot of the way that, that people, right, saw this open pit mining, sometimes more negatively, right, than positively, right? Because it seemed to be changing the whole nature of Butte along with the mine. Okay. Let's talk about something fun. <laughs> Um, 
one thing, right, that I, I would say, you know, I, I, I've always struggled with a good way to say this, um, especially people who don't know is mining as well, right? But, you know, as I was talking about how open pit mines expand, right, they expand, right? And they're kind of an expanding factor, right? They've got to eat up more territory, right, to get more, more, more material. And that's also because, right, you're not just building, right, the open pit, but you've got to have places to put all your waste, right? So you've got to have a place to dump it, right? Um, and certainly, right, you can see in Butte, right, the big Yankee Doodle tailings pond, right? That's as large, if not much larger, than the actual open pit operations, right? And that's true in every mining site, right? You've got to have places to put waste, you've got to have places to move material, you have to have places to process material, right? So you have to have a concentrator, right, like we do on site, have on site, right? So, right, as they're kind of eating up space and they're realizing, right, the anaconda companies realizing that they need more space than they had originally allotted, right? They talked about how we needed to move parts of view, right? And these were talked about often in the company documents as surface features, right? This is a lot of the language that shows up. Whenever I saw surface features, I meant, oh, that means people's houses, right? And businesses, right? And so they, they had this problem, right? If they're gonna keep open pit mining, they need to come up with some way to do it, right? And move people. Um, and so I have Luigi up here. Right? So I'm sure a lot of you in Butte probably know him much better than me, right? Um, but I think this is, uh, I thought, would be kind of a fun way to introduce you to some of the kind of process. He's not really in my book in any uh, particularly large way, but I just, you know, ran across a big trove of materials on um, Luigi, so I thought it would be fun to talk a little bit about it, right? Um, so I've got a, a quick uh, bit here from A Night at Luigi's, right? So this is our famous Butte nightclub operator here. Operator. Um, right, this club was open right from the 1960s to the early 1980s, right? So every night, right, you've got a mix of bad jokes, gadgets, puppets, drinks, metal tubes, right? You bang little metal tubes, there's a lot of fun with that. And a 28 piece band. The trick, of course, was that the band was just him, right? It was him <laughs> playing 28 instruments at once. And every time a, a, a customer entered Luigi's to grab a drink, Right, the opening door would pull wires that would trigger a toy monkey that would do somersaults, right? Every time a man came out of the bathroom, a bell would ring and the club's owner, of course, <laughs> Luigi himself, would loudly announce that the embarrassed man had likely failed to wash his hands and probably forgot to zip his pants, leaving his, quote, common denominator hanging out. <laughs> Bad jokes all the way. If someone needed to light a cigarette, right, you'd pull out a cigarette lighter, right, that was like as twice as big as your head, right? Um, right, and the best part right, is that every night, if once enough people had gathered and you cajoled them enough, he would, uh, you know, do a performance, right, as the world's biggest one-man band, right? Main instrument, of course, is an accordion, um, but his right foot played bells, bongo drums, operated a variety of puppets, including Sleazy, who banged on cymbals, uh, Scotty, who smacked a snare drum, and Lottie, who played xylophone. Uh, left foot uh, was probably busier. It played uh, more puppets and animals. We got clowns, there were miniature animals. I believe there was a Groucho Marx doll, as I recall. Um, he used his mouth, right, to blow the harmonica, provide bird calls, tell jokes. Uh, there would, like, sometimes he'd play bubbles, right? It was a big bubbles song, and he'd release <laughs> bubbles into the air um, when he played his, his popular Calypso number, right? Those are another fun photos from Luigi. He considered himself the ultimate showman, right? Many national publications you'd see him represented in Good Housekeeping, The New Yorker. Um, they certainly agreed. Um, I think in some ways, right, he represented the best of what was a pretty vibrant nightlife, right, the mining city. Before he operated his own club, and this is why he comes up here, right, he learned performance really in Butte's thriving neighborhood in Meterville. Um, he arrived in Butte in the 1930s. Uh, he would mine all day and then play accordion all night. Um, and he would say something, oh, I have a good quote here, we danced so long the milkman left us a bottle of milk in the morning. <laughs> um, he left Butte briefly, right, during a strike in the 1940s, so he actually was mining in Alaska, but he came right back. In 1951, he bought his own bar, the Arc Light, which was just a few blocks west of Muterville proper. Um, and when the Berkeley Pit, right, expanded into Muterville in the 1960s, the company bought out the Arc Light, right, they bought out a lot of the uh, east, uh, east side too. Um, and so he followed a lot of these, uh, actually a number of, of Meterville bar and restaurant owners down right onto the suburban flats. Not as many as maybe we might have liked. Um, his new suburban club, right, bore the name Luigi, right? 
But I, the one interesting reason why I wanted to bring him up, right, is that he's a, he's a Minnesota-born man of Slovak descent, right? <laughs> um, Ludwig Drenik, or Drenic, depending on how we want to pronounce it. Um, but in some ways, right, and as far as I could tell from a lot of the writing he did and said, right, he kind of changed, he got, gained this name Luigi, right, and it fits so well because essentially kind of nightlife and Meterville and Italianness were all kind of intertwined, right, a lot of people in Butte's minds. So even though Meterville had lots of people from lots of different ethnic heritages, right, you were Italian if you were Meterville, right? And so he became Luigi because he was a Meterville guy, right? <clears throat> There's a little map of some of the neighborhoods, um, right? View, right, we now know mostly, right, especially it's kind of an Irish town, right? But um, neighborhoods on the eastern side of the hill, right? So all of this stuff up here, I could probably actually use a pointer, couldn't I? Does that work? Ooh, it does. Um, right? If we're looking around here, right, these areas right, in the early 20th century, right, became homes to southern and eastern European immigrants, right? So you have McQueen, right? Right here, here's McQueen. Um, right, that was especially known as the Slavic neighborhood. Right, the east side over here hosted many uh, groups, although Finntown's probably the most well-known part of the east side, right, which, as you might imagine, had fins on it, and the classic joke was that uh, in Finntown there was a street called Fish Street, which was called Fish Street because it had fins on either side of it. <laughs> and then there was Meterville, right? Meterville is especially well-known as an Italian um, neighborhood, although it certainly had many other groups involved too, as do in general almost every ethnic neighborhood you've ever heard of, right? We kind of generalize and think that they all have one group of people in them. And so Luigi's story, I think, really mirrors the story of a lot of other Butte residents, right? Because during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, so many people like him were bought out and relocated one way or another, either down onto the suburban flats, right? Sometimes they moved over to the, the hills. I, uh, actually, McGlone Heights on here, this is one of the first sections over here in West Butte where people were relocated, right, from the mines. Um, so there's a number of people from Meterville and Queen who ended up there in McGlone Heights, but most of the rest of them ended up here on the flats in one way or another, right? You can kind of find different locations if you know where you're looking, right? You can find some of the old homes that were moved, right, because a lot of people would sell their home and they'd buy it back for a dollar, and then they move their home back then. Um, I think this is interesting, right, because the sad situation that Luigi experienced and lots of others um, is that you can use it to see a little bit about what happened to some of these ethnic communities as the Berkeley pit moved outwards, right? Um, so I'll take a look at Meterville here since we don't really have time to look at everything. Um, Meterville itself, right, had about, oh, 200 homes. Um, here's a nice little postcard from the the library. So you got mountains rising up in the Continental Divide on the east. Um, it was called Meterville, right, because Charles Meter built a smelter there in the 1880s. And so it, it kind of generally acquired his name. And it developed rather haphazard, right? It's kind of a jumble of streets. It doesn't look particularly like, you know, your classic suburb, although it is kind of a suburb to view in some other ways, right? But it's kind of develops around the Leonard Mine and the Leonard Mine Works. By the 1910s, right, you have immigrants from Italy uh, dominating Meterville's business and social scene, right? Many of those immigrants came from northern Italy, particularly the Piedmont, right? But the central areas like Tuscany, they're also a common source. Um, after Meterville's smelter closed, most men worked in the nearby underground mines. Um, some of the women, right, washed clothes at home, they worked in small businesses, they cooked, baked, waited tables in um, the food service industry. Um, even in the 1950s and 60s, the Italian language actually remained fairly common at Meterville gatherings. Um, residents maintained a pretty active social life. Uh, Italian men in particular, right, joined the Cristoforo Colombo Club, um, which was originally, right, a benefit society that would help you if you would become injured or your family became injured. But it also, right, became a social group and it hosted dinners, picnics, Columbus Day events, um, fundraising activities, right? All of these, right, are ways that they connected the neighborhood and Italian Americans more generally across Butte. I'd also say that food traditions in particular, right, provided a real sense of identity for people in Meterville. Um, in the early days, right, you'd have freight cars show up and bring grapes to Meterville so they could make wine. Um, once that beverage became popular in, uh, in Butte, right, Italians started selling it, right, to the rest of the community. There were five small groceries there. 
um, including the Meadville Mercantile, or the Merc, the Meadie <laughs> Brothers Merc, uh, Grocery, right? Those are places you can also get Italian specialties, right? You get salty fish, you get sausages, salamis, olives, cheese, right? Um, pretty much every house there had a garden, so they're also growing a lot of foods, too. And maybe more importantly, and probably more famously, Meadville's lively restaurant and club scene, right, showcased a lot of this uh, Italian food, right, which also became kind of an important link between Italians and non-Italians, right? So the first of Meadville's clubs opens in the 20s. Uh, most of them would serve these elaborate Italian meals to attract business. Um, so you'd have an antipasto with caviar, crudite, salami, um, smoked salmon, anchovies, breadsticks, right? You have your second course with salads, spaghetti, raviolis, third course, piece of chicken, enormous steak. You're eating a lot of food, right? Mm -hmm. um, Meadville is actually a lot like a lot of other little Italy's um, across the US um, because it helped to make Italian food popular. Um, before World War I, Americans generally believed Italians themselves to be dirty, disloyal, right? They argued Italian food contained too many vegetables. <laughs> In general, people thought vegetables right, lacked nutritional value because they were just, they test them, they were just mostly water, right? Um, but, right, there was more time conditions placed a greater value on vegetables, right? In World War I, right, there was this, you know, people were growing gardens, right? Um, and also, right, Italy's an ally. So now suddenly Italian food is looking a little bit better. Um, when immigration quotas, right, reduced the arrivals of single men in the 20s, right, the women who had run boarding houses in places like Meterville, right, for the men, actually stepped up their production of things like wine and grappa to attract new customers, right? Um, so do you guys know grappa, right? So it's, it's also made from grapes. It's a fairly strong um, alcoholic beverage. <laughs> Um, so you'd show up, right, and especially as you get into Prohibition, you'd show up at these meterville places to get a drink, and while you were drinking, you'd eat food too, right? And so this actually happened in a lot of Little Italy's, and again, is one of the reasons why now so many people eat Italian <coughs> food, despite having no real connections to Italy. Um, the new nightclubs themselves, right, relied especially on local female chefs to run their kitchens. Um, so here's probably the most famous of them, the Rocky Mountain Cafe. Um, it gained renown for its steak dessert, dinners, right? It employed um, uh, the mother of, of Marlene Holater, um, who I did a great interview with. Um, so her, her grandmother, right, had become a widow due to a mine accident. She's only in her 30s, right? She had a relative still in Italy. Um, and so her grandmother opened a boarding house, right? So her daughter kind of honed her skills cooking there. And her daughter eventually, right, took over, right? Fairly commonplace story for a lot of immigrants, right, who would actually often get into American business life through things like the restaurant industry. And food traditions I, promoted by these clubs, I think also really connected Meterville's residents to each other, right? So they uh, select some Italian foods of, uh, over others, right? So, you know, if anyone's been to Italy, right, what you eat in Italy varies pretty widely, right? Um, in Northern Italy, right, the most common staple was the stiff cornmeal polenta. Um, you'd have rice, butter, um, you'd have um, other kinds of foods. Right in the south is where you get things like pasta, tomatoes, beans, um, things that we might more typically think. Um, social class, right, also played a role, right? So in Italy, the rich would eat meat and macaroni. The laborers and farmers would just, you know, eat meager diets, right? Bread, oil, right? salt. Um, so what actually happens in some ways in Meterville, right, they kind of rally around both upper class foods, because they're feeling more upper class, they're in the US and they can afford it now, right? And they also rallied around Southern Italian foods. So a lot of the Northern Ita Italian foods would be eaten at home, but were not served right in the eateries. Um, and so I think this is actually pretty interesting because it shows how um, these neighborhoods themselves kind of cultivated and changed, right, the kinds of traditions and foods that people would eat. But also, right, this is a pretty exciting place to go, right, because you would see signs all over Meadowville as known as the Little Las Vegas, right? I mean, there were new ways to socialize here, right? Um, there were people who generally keep up a collection to pay off the police so that you could keep gambling, right? Um, and there was pretty open gambling across Meadowville, especially if not the rest of Butte. Um, there were more, more, these new clubs were pretty open to women, right? Women could go in and socialize. And if you look in 1955 at the start of the Berkeley Pit, this is still going on very strongly, right? I mean, Meterville is still a happening place, right? There, I think I counted, you know, still another, uh, you know, 20 to 30 play, like clubs you could go to, right? 
Okay, so what happens? So when open pit mining right arrives, um, there's actually a pretty strong fight back against it. I think um, this is a fight that a lot of people have forgotten, right? But there was actually a lot of protesting. There was protesting by people who saw this happening to their neighborhoods, right? So this is up in Walkerville, right? So we're up north, and that's where the Alice Pit mine was. So it was one of the, it was actually at this point, it was probably about as big as the first initial Berkeley pit, where they started about the same time. They just stopped the Alice Pit earlier. And the people in Walkerville actually were pretty successful. They actually closed down the mine a couple of times, right, from Anaconda. They used all sorts of techniques. They would claim that a thing was a public road and they couldn't mine. Um, they made sure that people had to buy off um, people all at once, right, as opposed to one by one, right? Um, and so, you know, people in Walkerville, people in Meterville too, right, actually gained a fair amount of power. So at the exact same time when unions are pretty strong, they're able to fight a pretty strong fight against open pit mining too. But the Anaconda Company learns from these protests, right? It starts buying homes on more of a one-to-one -one basis, right? So then everyone's kind of worried that their neighbor got a better deal and that maybe they need to sell out. Um, it also successfully lobbied the Montana State Legislature to give it the power of eminent domain, right? So they could actually condemn any material, any area that was in the way, right, of an open pit mine or needed areas for open pit mining, right? Um, and so, right, mining, right, as a public good, therefore, meant that Anaconda didn't really usually have to use this power, right, but it could. It was a bit of a cudgel, right? So you would eventually negotiate out and buy it anyway. You can see some of these initial cracks here. This is running through uh, Walkerville. So Anaconda is also trying to save itself, or guard itself from legal jeopardy. Um, and so there's a lot of blasting and digging and new kinds of hazards. It's not like underground mining wasn't hazardous to other people above, but they also didn't know what it was going to look like or how it was going to look, what it was going to do, or if this was more dangerous or less dangerous than underground mining. Um, Anaconda also was able to figure things out. Right? They had a lot of a good team of lawyers, and they were able to make some pretty strong claims that um, blasting damage, although blasting is very loud and everyone could hear it, right? typically was not actually causing that much damage, but it would cause a lot of complaints. The Anaconda actually managed to pay a lot less for its complaints. I think I found something like, uh, here I have, uh, up until the 1980s, Anaconda settled about 45% of underground subsidence complaints, right? So things where the ground was shifting underneath because of underground mining, but only about 7% of about the 500 blasted complaints did they pay any money for, right? So they were pretty good at negotiating. They'd show up at your house with you know some seismographs and show you that like you were at, were actually getting damaged and that you were just imagining it, right? Um, and I think in general, right, they were often correct, right? And that's actually one of the interesting parts about this, right? But it was also really hard for residents to know what to do, right? They didn't have their own machinery, right? They didn't have their own engineers to show up and make a different, better claim, right? And so that's in some ways why this is happening. Um, so you're also seeing this encroach on places like Meterville. And so there's people just kind of increasingly moving out, right? Empty homes would often light on fire, right? You'd have holdouts questioning each other, right? So you'd have a real threat to a lot of these social worlds, including places like Meterville that were such kind of strongly bonded communities. Um, and in general, right, people, when they're looking at communities relocating, will say, well, either they, you know, people who research this will say, well, you'll move out of this community and you know, no one will ever continue these kinds of traditions. Or they say they move out of this community and they're just fine, right? And I think in general, you see with places like Meterville that relocation itself was very painful, right? Um, you'd spread people across Butte. Um, and so, right, I, I, you know, I have one that, um, when I talked to um, Angelo Petroni, um, who was a former Meterville fighter chief, um, he, he essentially said something along the lines of the only time we see each other anymore, right, is at weddings, wakes, and funerals, right? So there was a lot of people who just didn't see each other as much, right? There's greater physical distance, which created social distance. Um, so some traditions became difficult to maintain, right? It was actually harder to keep a large garden down on the flats. The soil's a little bit sandier. Um, and so that was harder. If you were older, right? Especially those older people who mostly spoke Italian, right? it was harder to talk to your new neighbors, right? Um, so there was a lot of big changes there for a lot of these people. Um, and so, you know, they worried a lot about some of these social effects. Right? Um, as they were battling over lots of other places right, that faced open pit mining, right? because then you have right, a fight over Columbia Gardens, right? this side, 
right? There's a fight over whether or not the new mine that they wanted to put in there, right, needed to mean that relocation, right? There's an intense battle then over whether or not they should relocate the central business district uptown, right, to make way for mine. And so a lot of these battles, right, were painful and struggles, right? But in general, right, a lot of the social bonds in general either were remaintained or rebuilt. And I'm gonna show you at least one quick way how. Some of it was just increased awareness, right, for historic preservation especially, right? So some of the battles over central business district ended partly because people started to treasure old buildings more, right? They started to treasure parts of the environment more. Um, some of this also happened to be ways that they, oh, here's a great, this is a great photo of McQueen, the dump wow. right here. So you can see how close, right? Wow. The was coming. But I'd say that other ways, some of these bonds were actually in some ways kind of re-maintained, re right? So you had places like Lydia's, if anyone's eaten at Lydia's recently, right? Which maintains a lot of the old Meterville traditions, right? It's right a place that in some ways, right, they came down from Meterville, right? It maintains a lot of those traditions. There's other ways, right, in which a lot of these old lost neighborhoods, right, have had a lot of reunions, especially since the 2000s, right? So I've been to a number of these reunions, which are fun places to go chat with people from old neighborhoods, right? But you can also tell like a lot of new reconnectings happening, right? They're showing up old photos, news clippings, they're showing up to talk to each other, right? To listen to new music. And so I think there's some ways that especially the, the kind of younger generations, right? When I say younger, now most of these people, right, are not necessarily younger, right? <laughs> right, but people who didn't, right, were, were like kids when Meterville, right, was impacted or places like Meterville were impacted. They're the ones who kind of helped to rebuild a lot of these social connections because those places still meant something to them and it meant a lot uh, to them in a different way than it did for an older person, right? Um, and so I think you can see some ways in which a lot of these things became uh, more positive. But you can see, right, there's also still a lot of loss in that story, too. This is just, I just overlaid this map. This is an old Sanborn Street map, right? Um, these are maps, right, overlaid over the pit, right? And here you can see, right, a lot of what is lost in Butte isn't disappear into the pit. In fact, you can actually drive out and see some of the old roads still, right? Right? But they had to move them for dumps and waste and roads and things like that. Um, and so, you know, I think there's, there's some ways in which, right, attempting to try and remember these lost neighborhoods has been uh, both a, a fun way, sometimes a bit heartbreaking, but also a really warm way for people to reconnect with their old friends. All right, so I want to just uh, quickly end by uh, saying that, obviously, um, these are just a couple kinds of stories, right, so that um, you can get a sense of types of things that I cover in the book. Um, and also some really interesting new stories that everyone else should start researching and talking about because Butte is so rich with wonderful history. Um, this is me, and you can always contact me. I'm also more than happy to <coughs> chat, and I have some time for a few okay. questions right now, either in public or if you want to ask me afterwards in the talk, too. Um, and I'm also happy to sign books if anyone wants to do that. Um, but anyways, if you guys want to ask any questions, I'm, I'm uh, happy to do so, or if anyone wants to do anything. Okay, no, great. I'm just turning what, it off. Any questions? What can I do for you? Yeah. You know what I was just wondering?